So this is a little relaxation for you all, I think, because um, this is not about stone uh, ceremonial features or ceremonial stone landscapes, but it's about um, Great Towers National Historic Site, which is the which is right down the road here, six miles in Milford, Pennsylvania. So Gray Towers is the first and only National Historic Site in the U.S. Forest Service. All others that you know of, National Historic Sites, not state, but national, are, you'll find in the National Park Service. This one was established in 2004 by Congress to serve the purpose of being a National Historic Site. Um, it's the home of American conservation, the way we say it. Um, the John Muir crew, crew would, uh, would argue that he is, but it's uh, really conservation is, is uh, the U.S. Forest Service um, as an agency. So um, I will go through and talk about Gray Towers and the site and Gifford Pinchot and his role in, in developing conservation in America. Um, at the end, I hope I remember, and with my wife's help I will, I'll talk about a little bit about stone landscapes at Gray Towers. I haven't looked at them as closely, but I will now. Uh, I think they're more farm oriented, but uh, um, at least one set is close to Gray Towers, and uh, I believe it <coughs> might have some indigenous American uh, roots. So. Gifford Pinchot, first chief of the U.S. Forest Service. Him and Teddy Roosevelt started the Forest Service in 1905. Uh, before that, Gifford was serving in the Bureau of Forestry, uh, which was a smaller government agency, and it was under the Department of the Interior. Um, the Forest Service is now under Department of Agriculture. So how did this all happen? So um, early on in America, it was open game for settling land, for harvesting trees, for basically doing what you wanted. Um, there was no such thing as forestry in America, even as late as the 1880s, 1890s, when Gifford started trying to learn about forestry. Um, first in America at Yale, and then he went to Europe to learn European forestry. They were way ahead of us in managing land, managing forests, and harvesting for uh, you know, manufacturing purposes for construction. Um, he did that in France, Germany, Switzerland, and I think a little bit in Turkey. Um, mostly he found that his studies in Switzerland with the Switzerland um, Forestry Department uh, was most like us because it was a democracy and they operated similarly in their, their economy with forestry. Um, prior to that, I want to jump into the Pinchot family. The Pinchot family came from France, about 50 miles north of Paris, in a little town called Brutille. Um, they were Bonapartists. So in 1815, when Napoleon lost at Waterloo, uh, they knew they had to get out of France because the Bobons were taking care of uh, anybody that supported Napoleon. So they left, they came to America, they brought their goods uh, and their wealth, they had some wealth, and settled in New York first, but then soon here in Milford. Um, in Milford because there was a lot of French Huguenots here, and a lot of Huguenots throughout this, this area. Um, so it was a familiar place with the French language was being spoken freely, just like English. So they came here, they started buying land, and ultimately, Gifford's grandfather um, started buying land and harvesting trees. Well, they were clear cutting. Um, he was doing what everybody else was doing, clear cutting lumber, sending it down the river to Philadelphia for sale. Not, not to be, uh, not a surprise, but of course it had devastation on the land. Um, Cyril did that for quite a few years. He ended up doing that as far as Michigan. I mean, he was buying and harvesting lumber, um, making his money and, and also doing dry goods. Ultimately, it had that effect on the, on the, uh, on the land and on uh, what we would consider the cons conservation of land. So Gifford's father then 
decided he wasn't going to make his money in harvesting lumber. He wasn't going to make it in Milford. He's going to go to New York City. So he made a fortune by the time he was 45 in selling French wallpaper. Imported, brought it here, sold it. He was in some other dry goods too, but wallpaper is where he made his money. So at 45, he retires to Milford, um, eventually building gray towers. So I'm going to move on to that. Okay, Great Towers is a French chateau. It sits on the hill just outside of Milford. It's quite a spectacular property. Um, I think that the Pinchot owned well over a thousand acres and even more, I think, later on. They had quite a, quite a bit of property. Um, that is the center of the National Historic Site. There's a lot more to the landscape and the, and the property, but this is what James built, Gifford's father. Gifford ended up inheriting the property when he came back and got married in 1914. Okay. Uh, two pictures here. Here's Gifford on the on the right here with Teddy Roosevelt. Um, they were establishing um, at this point, right about this time, establishing what the U.S. Forest Service would be and what role it would have. Um, conservation in their mind was proper management of the forest, proper management of the watersheds, harvesting properly, and selling the lumber so we have the availability. I don't think too many people think about they go to Lowe's or they go to Home Depot to buy lumber. Where's it coming from? Well, it's coming from companies that harvest on for service land by permit and, and selling it off, milling it and selling it off. Also comes from private land too, but Forest Service primary purpose is, is that. Um, on the left, you'd see um, Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir right next to him, and a, and a crew of other people there in Yosemite. Um, the National Park Service uh, has a different role. They preserve land to see how it evolves like it did naturally. So uh, parks and national forests are, you can compare and contrast them. You know, what, what's their purpose? What's their mission? What are they doing? I think they're both doing a great job, but uh, um, I work for both agencies, so I'm a little, <laughs> a little biased. Um, move on to the next. <clears throat> yeah, him playing his role. So Gifford uh, started out right out when he got, when he got out of, uh, came back from Europe. His first opportunity was working at Biltmore Estate in North Carolina for the Vanderbilts. Um, he developed the land, uh, the landscape there, especially the uh, forested landscape on that hilltop that was basically denuded um, to build the mansion. Um, afterwards, he started the agency. He worked for five years. Um, Teddy Roosevelt leaves office. Taft becomes president. Taft and him, him have a disagreement about the way to manage land, especially uh, what was going on in Alaska. Um, they were going outside of what was thought to be the proper conservation. Gifford made that known. Gifford got fired. Um, at the next election, Taft lost. I mean, I think Gifford won the, won the argument in the long run because the mining that was being allowed in Alaska was pretty devastating to the land up there. Um, afterwards, Gifford became governor of Pennsylvania for a term. Um, at that time, you couldn't serve consecutive terms, so he, his second term was uh, one term removed. Um, by the way, if you're having a drink tonight, the alcohol laws after Prohibition were Gifford Pinchot's administration. He decided how, how Pennsylvania manages um, liquor and beer. One thing the Pinchos did was, uh, still while Gifford was, was young and, and uh, when he was first in the agency, was they established the Yale School of Forestry. They endowed it with a quarter of a million dollars, quite a bit of money in 1901. Um, and they had Yale students who were new forestry students, the newest foresters in America. Um, they came to Gray Towers property and they camped on a wooded, a wooded lot above the mansion, above and south of the mansion. Um, Gifford's in the circle here in the bottom. Um, Aldo Leopold and numerous other names uh, you'd recognize 
uh, came here for summer classes. So the summer classes were held here. Downtown Milford has Forest Hall. They had classrooms upstairs. That was again built by the Pinchos. Um, the Pinchos did a, did a lot for the community and for conservation. To really get forestry and, the, and conservation in the mind of Americans. Um, at the time, I mean, they're still fighting the, uh, the ideas that you could just do what you wanted. I mean, that's still out there, but for the most part, I think the Pinchos started something new, not only in Pennsylvania, but beyond. Um, the students stayed in tents right up on that wooded lot. It was, uh, it's quite a thing, and it's, um, we're looking towards its future preservation right now. We're talking about it. So this is an aerial view of the property in 1931 that the Pinchos had taken. Um, great shot of the property we own. Um, I use this picture often because there have been changes, but um, little, little things that uh, exist on the property. The landscape was fully designed after, was expanded greatly from what James and his wife Mary had built. Um, they had the, uh, the mansion house, which you can see, I think the, the one arrow points to it. But pretty much the rest of the landscape, uh, except for a few features, um, were built by Gifford and Cornelia, his wife. Um, it's pretty beautiful, especially right now. The flowers are blooming. It is just spectacular. And this is that same photo, but blown up to show you where the Yale um, forestry camp was. Um, and this is just a few years after it had closed, but the buildings are still standing. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the property, and we'll get caught up on time because I'm, I'm not going to uh, stay on this too long. Um, again, National Historic Sites in Milford, Pennsylvania, ancestral home of the Pinchos. They did have other homes. They were pretty, pretty well off. Um, they had homes in New York City and Connecticut, Simsbury where Gifford was born. That was uh, Mary's side of the family. Um, and they had uh, 303 acres that were designated the National Historic Site. Um, currently, 202 are still owned by the Pinchot family. Uh, they hold it in trust, and um, the, all the descendants of the one side of the family actually hold that property. Um, in addition to that, they have 1,200 acres known as the Milford Experimental Forest just outside of town, um, they intend to hold that in the future. And that would be um, Gifford's grandson, Peter, who's now about 70 some years old. Um, so here's some old views of the mansion. Um, soon after it was built, and, and then some, um, the one on the upper left is I, it wasn't even finished at that point. You can see the horse and carriage out in front. That's pretty much the way you got around. Um, this is done by one of the Hudson River School artists, uh, Sanford Gifford, um, Gifford's actual uh, namesake, Sanford Gifford, um, the artist. Uh, beautiful view. I actually love that, that one painting. And then some years later, um, on the lower left and lower right, you can see Milford in the background. That's how close it is, but it's actually in the township. It's actually outside of town, uh, technically. Um, I lost a photo on the left. I don't know how that happened. Uh, that showed the entrance gateway. There's a gatehouse and an entrance drive, um, and I had a picture of that. Sorry, I didn't get it. But I love this photo with the uh, luminaire. Um, we had that at one of our Christmas events. In different lighting, the mansion's just spectacular, really uh, catches light really well. We don't know how it was named, for sure, how it was named Gray Towers, although in Mary's diary, this, is, this would be James, Gifford's father's, um, or Gifford's mother, Mary, um, had in her diary how beautiful the Gray Towers look in the sunrise. You know, so we think that might be where, that, where the name came. This is the inside uh, of, the, of the mansion. This is called the Great Hall. This is the way you enter into the building. Um, restored to the period. That, the whole downstairs is restored to the, the period when Gifford was last governor. 
because that's the best documentation we have. We have full photo documentation the family took. Um, all, almost every bit of the furniture, paintings, is, is original. The light fixtures have been changed, of course, but um, the rugs are period rugs. They aren't original. This is the library room. They had an enormous book collection. We only have a third of their books on the shelves. The rest are in storage. This is the sitting room, highly decorated. Um, this is like 1934. This was, this was done. Um, it, of course, has been restored. It was repainted, but it's two pictures. It's two the, the pictures that we own. Grand staircase, beautiful in the house. Great woodwork. Um, it was actually an English architect who helped trim it out after Richard Morris Hunt designed the house. Um, the English architect, Henry Edwards Ficken, uh, worked with James to make the house the way they wanted it. We believe it was supposed to model the Pinchot home in Europe um, that they left behind after in 1816. Um, this is the third, second and third floor halls. These are great rooms right in the center of all the bedrooms. It really makes a nice meeting, meeting place. Um, and we hold, on the second and third floors, we hold conferences. Conservation-oriented groups, um, mostly Forest Service, some Park Service, and some other agencies, but non-for-profits are allowed to contact us for, for conferences. Um, we do have a capacity issue. We can't have more than 35, but it makes it intimate to have a nice small size group. If you get too large, it kind of gets unwieldy and out of hand. Um, and it really encourages people to speak out too when you have a smaller group. Some people that are um, well, introverted will, uh, can be coaxed into being a part of the whole thing, and that's the purpose. We grow leaders there. We call it our leadership conference area in the, in the Forest Service. People do love to come. Most of our agency folks love to come because it's the, it's the founding. It's like the, it's the birthplace. So it's really important to most agency employees. Gifford's bedroom and sitting room, both of them are restored to period, the way they were. It's actually on the second floor. Here's some of the outbuildings, the gatehouse, bait box, ice house, and letterbox. Letterbox was built by Gifford to house all of his archives all of his material from when he was agency head when he was the chief and then when he was governor all of the contents of the letterbox went to the library of congress when it was made the uh, national historic site gifford and the family wrote a lot so it's all of their papers even his father and grandfather and such um, because of the volume he is the sixth most linear foot of shelf space in the Library of Congress. It's a, it's a big accomplishment. I heard they used to type all answers to all letters to them, staple a CC, a carbon copy, which we don't see anymore, to the original and file it. It's enormous. Bait box. Good question, thank you. Don't let me forget. So the bait box, it's a little deceiving. It's stone and gorgeous in the front. It was built as a playhouse for his son. So he had a lot of political visitors. They had meetings and talked about issues of the day. And so him with the tutor or whatever, they would be, go to the bait box, a nice place to be, and his kid would be out of the way. Um, it's, it's a gorgeous space, it really is. See those rope columns on either side of the doorway? That you have to squeeze between them, and I think it was purposeful you know, to make you, you know, you're entering a space. Um, the gatehouse was, uh, it's at the gate, the front gate. It is, uh, was occupied by one of the caretakers at one point. Now we use it as housing for visiting uh, dignitaries. And the ice house was what it sounds like. They liked making ice cream. They had ice house, the ice house was full of ice and it went subterranean about 10 feet. Um, so packed right, it would last until August of the following year. Um, they used it often. Right now it's the bathrooms the exterior bathrooms. Uh, visitor Pavilion was built recently, 2005, six, seven, I think it finished the seven, in 2007. The bait box, along with the parking lots, it was a big uh, 
undertaking. And it was kept to the side out of view so it complied with historic preservation standards. Um, you can't see it from the mansion, in other words. These are Pinchot owned buildings yet. Um, tennis house in the upper left. This is called the stable house uh, on the upper right and Forest, Forrester's Cottage on the lower left. And then this is another view of the uh, stable house in the, in the lower right. Um, they retain these houses. They all, all the family members have homes, of course, in other areas. And they come and they meet here or they take it for a week like it's a timeshare. Um, family will juggle how they're gonna use the property um, through the, mostly through the summer, late spring, summer, fall. I think they'll, they'll start showing up here soon. Uh, but Peter and Nancy live only a few miles outside of, of Milford, um, actively involved and actively talk to the, the Forest Service. And if I keep saying we, it's because it's a habit. <laughs> it's not me anymore. It's Nicole's job. Nicole Bonarski's, put your hand up, Nicole. Nicole's another employee of the Forest Service at Gray Towers. Um, they own a waterfall. It's supposed to be one of the largest privately owned waterfalls in the East. Um, the Pinchos admitted to me, I said, well, how do you mean the largest? Tallest, widest, most volume? And she says, I don't know, I was told largest. I don't know. But it is, it's beautiful. And to have it on your property is pretty spectacular. Um, and it was acquired in 1886, or I'm sorry, 84, when they were gonna build the, the house in 86. So it was part of the land that they, they built on, or they wanted to build on. These pools on the right, they're above the, fall, the larger falls, and even the smaller falls. And you see the two, two falls on the left, they kind of stacked up. Behind that upper falls are pools. Um, that were carved into the stone by water action. And the, that's where the Yale students cleaned up at the end of the day. They didn't have showers, they just would swim in the pools. That's a well-known fact and a lot of newspaper articles in, the, in, in Milford paper at the time about how they used to uh, uh, swim in their birthday suits and they weren't respectful enough, you know. Typical college kids. Um, a lot of sculpture on the property. The family loved sculpture. They had all kind of uh, animal sculpture, terracotta pots, eagles, um, Lafayette there in the upper left. They, they revered him and had him in a prime spot in front of the house. Um, one of their ancestors had fought with him in the revolution, so. Um, beautiful stuff. This is probably the most remembered piece of the property. It's called the finger bowl. This was their dining room table. So you see it being used here in the upper right by one of our conference groups. Um, they would fill it. Well, we, we keep it full through the, through the, the right seasons, you know, um, summer mostly. Um, floating flowers and, and candles in it for the, for the meals. It's, uh, it's spectacular. We only do it for leadership groups, usually the upper echelon of the, of the agency. Um, but it's a, it's a remarkable place to dine. You can't think of one better. The Pinchos would have the food brought out from the kitchen in wooden bowls and laid in the water. And so if you, if you wanted mashed potatoes, all I had to do was tap the bowl and it would go to you. It's cool. It's real cool. Trudy, what do you think of dinner there at the... Pretty special. <laughs> I was invited once and I was allowed to bring Trudy for a dinner. Other parts of the landscape and the hardscape, they had a swimming pool, you can see here. We've, we had to fill it in, um, and it's been made into another place for congregating. We put openings in the, in the walls of the pool, um, so it's another place where you can, we can congregate people outside. The landscape is just as beautiful as the mansion. It really is, right? like I said, right now with the flowers, spectacular. Um, they did geometric figures. We have our star terrace and star diamond terrace, uh, the marble court. Um, they did, uh, you know, create with stone. They created like water type reflective um, areas, um, water features. They had like seven water features on the property. 
Um, this long pole is really cool because it's an optical illusion. 18 inches on this end, and it's only eight inches wide on the other, so it creates this deep, deep view. And that also happens with the plantings. The plantings narrow, narrow in. So the landscape architect that worked with Cornelia Pinchot, um, Cornelia demanded it because she would make corrections and changes. Um, but they really worked real hard. Chester Aldrich was the main landscape architect at Gray Towers um, over the years with Cornelia, and it just, uh, they did a great job for such a small space around the mansion. It's really spectacular. They had a walled garden for flowers and vegetables. Um, it's about two acres, and um, they used it well. We don't use it too much because the uh, Pincho side of the family, it's not divided, it's just open. So. Um, we can't keep people out of that side, so we, we allow people to look in, but you can't go in and meander just yet. We're working on that. This is downtown Milford, right at the red light. This is the Pinchot home before the mansion. Okay, this is a right, right at the corner in downtown. It was built early and then bought by the Pinchos and, and uh, developed further. <laughs> Um, Forest Hall on this side, you can see the stuccoed part of the building, that's Forest Hall with the classrooms that were upstairs for the, for the uh, Yale students. Uh, the original post office, the Pinchos built for the community, and then this, the columned building next to it, the Greek Revival building, is their original store, which was razzed uh, to build Forest Hall. Um, beautiful architecture. There's Forest Hall. And here's the upstairs part that is uh, a new owner. So the antique shop has been moved out. Um, so you can walk in and see art exhibits and it's wide open, beautiful space. The Pinchos brought a lot of people to their property. Um, horseback riding was, was a favorite of, of theirs, um, but having uh, socials, ice cream socials, um, especially when he was running for office, uh, the community was heavily involved in, in uh, enjoying great hours. And then we have conferences. I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Um, that's the end of the show. But if I can, um, I wanted to talk about um, tribal relations. I was a tribal liaison for the Forest Service at Great Towers. Um, even though we have a small property, we're right smack in the middle of the Lenape homeland. Um, and uh, Nicole Bernarski is now taking over that role. Thank you, Nicole, for doing that upon me leaving. Um, and part of what federal agencies do is interact with federally recognized tribes. There's three federally recognized Lenape tribes in domestically in the United States, and then there's two in Canada, and we interact with them primarily. And so the, the three that we deal with are the Lenape, they, uh, Delaware Nation, they're in Anandarko, Oklahoma, Delaware Tribe of Indians, and they are in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and then the Stockbridge Muncie in Wisconsin. Uh, the two in Canada we don't interact with, we do know of them, I've talked to them, but we, we don't carry on business with them because they're outside the country. Um, they're, um, and we Federally recognized tribes, there's 540 some across the United States, Canada, and Hawaii. Um, they go through a strict process of being recognized. Um, it's a seven point process and the Bureau of Indian Affairs carries that out. So I heard us talking about tribes, I don't know who's tribal in here and uh, all respect to y'all, but um, we interact only with federally recognized tribes. There are treaty rights, there are responsibilities the government has to recognize tribes. And as federal employees, we have to interact with them and them alone. Um, it's a good role. Um, we recognize that there are people who stayed behind, married out of the tribe, and stayed, did not follow the tribes westbound as they were pushed uh, uh, westbound. But um, for the most part, the tribes that have the history of being tribal, they know their history, they know all their leaders, they, they can prove all their background, they know who signed the, do the treaty documents. 
And curiously enough, the first treaty was in 1778. That was with the Delaware Nation at Fort Pitt, Pennsylvania. Yeah, very first one. I have a copy of it. So um, stone cairn wise, um, we have right outside of Great Towers property about one mile. Uh, I know Jim knows about them, right on Bust Road, uh, not too far off of Route 6. And they can be seen from the road. They're very, very interesting, conical shaped, beautiful looking. A couple have fallen, but they're uh, what I find interesting, and so do the tribes um, that I've talked to, is um, that they've really lasted as long as they have. That's, that's a curious thing, I think. It's important to know that. And it's also the ones I've seen from Jim, not all of them, but most of them, Jim, have been in um, the headwaters. They're in springy, boggy areas that head. Now that one on Bust Road, the water ends up in the Salt Hill Creek. But uh, it's, it's why the land wasn't developed, that's for sure. And that's helped our preservation. I, uh, I look forward to learning more about these, and uh, I think it's fantastic. But uh, is there any questions? Yes. Do we have time for questions? I think um, we might have a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the Sherman Room on the Great Towers? Sure. Why Sherman Room? I was just curious what their relationship was to the to General Oh, to General Sherman. OK, so the James and Mary, not Gifford, but James and Mary, um, I'm sure Gifford might have met him, but James and Mary were friends with General Sherman. He lived for three years after the mansion was built, but they knew him in New York City because he lived in New York City. Um, I think it's really interesting with General Sherman. He had evidently been to the house, stayed there. They had a room named for him. And there's a tree on the property since been removed. It since died and we had to remove it, but uh, that he planted a Sherman maple tree. Right. Um, but anything else that you're... Yeah, well, they must have been very close when they were. He must have stayed there quite often if they named it over. He had three years. So 1886 it finished. He died in 89. Oh, I see. So it's only, you know, but it might have been important enough visitor that they said, hey, this is your room, you know. Yeah. Um, also, there was some, you didn't show the sculpture of Napoleon? No, I did not. Yeah, but uh, so I just heard recently that somebody told me, and, you know, it's a pretty much full... Um, sized uh, sculpture of Napoleon that would be in the letterbox uh, and that the cops were called up there for something and they were walking to the letterbox and they almost stopped. The <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't the letterbox. It was, in, it was in the ticket tower in, in the mansion. And yeah, there's a full size done by um, Lon Thompson. Thompson did it. Lon Thompson's a very famous sculptor. Um, and evidently James was friends with him too. He was friends with everybody in New York City. But anyway, he, um, he had him sculpted, but it's different. Say so, so Lont Thompson created a different type statue than is seen with, with Napoleon normally. So normally, you know, you, you're familiar with the foot out and the hand in the shirt, right? Uh, this is very, his hands are behind his back and he's looking down and he's very pensive, right? He's like, He's contemplating. So this is after he lost at Waterloo. He's in exile. Uh, Lont Thompson depicted him really well. I, I heard that from a sculptor who said, oh, look at the way he sculpted him. You know, it's different. So yeah. Yes? Yeah, I was at the New York State Archaeological Conference last weekend, and there was a speaker, in fact, was a guest speaker. He spoke about um, Napoleon's older brother, Joseph, having Yes. Any connections? That's correct. Um, I know that uh, when Lafayette did his grand tour in 1884-85 in, in America, I don't know if you know about that. It's a pretty interesting story about Lafayette touring America in 84-85. In but he stopped and stayed with him in Bordentown. That's recorded in his, he had a, a secretary record all of his stops and starts and speeches. Fantastic, yeah. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Did the Pinchos name, I believe it's a General Sherman uh, Redwood? Uh, no, I don't think they. I don't think they did that. But yeah, you, I'm aware of it. That that's the and, case. And what's and what's the meaning of bait box? Bait box. Well, um, his he called his son Mr. Fish. Gifford was a big fisherman and hunter, right? And he called his son Mr. Fish. And so the bait box was why. That's a good question. That, most people don't don't catch that. That's good. Right. We'll have to call it there. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs>